I would never ask my students to do something that I am not willing to do myself. Hello and welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 276. Today, we're joined by Sensei LaRoyce Bachelor. Thanks for stopping by. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick, and we're the ones that make the great quality sparring gear, the fun apparel, training accessories, and so much more. Seriously, if you saw the piles of products that we have in development right now, it is, well, it's out of control. I expect in the next few months, you will see quite the rollout of new items. And I'm so excited, and I wish I could talk about them, but I can't. What I can talk about, though, how's that for a segue, is all the great stuff that we've got going over at whistlekick.com. You can find the show notes for this and the other episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can check out martial arts calendar. You can check out memes. You can check out martialartspodcast.com. We just every couple months we we turn out a new idea we spin it into a website or a product just something because it feels like we want it and we expect that some of you out there will want it too the hub to find all that stuff really is whistlekick.com and of course the newsletter if you sign up for the newsletter we're going to send you an email once or twice a month that's honestly that's about it once in a while we'll do three or you know around the holidays we might send you a couple extras with discounts or something like that we do send you a discount once in a while but we're definitely not going to spam you we were absolutely not going to sell your information to anybody let's talk about today today on the show we have an incredible martial artist somebody that i was fortunate enough to speak with twice some of you may recall recently we had a number of episodes go belly up on us and today's guest was kind enough to come back and record again for what honestly became a better episode, a better conversation than we had the first time. An academic mind can be both a strength and a weakness in martial artists. Some may find a martial arts education easier than a conventional school education, while others find it the other way around. Our guest today is one who has seen success in both worlds and even borrowed from the traditions of one to expand their teachings of the other. She is both sensei and PhD, Sensei LaRoyce Bachelor. And we can say that she feels equally comfortable and even benefits from her time in both of these worlds. Her storytelling is compelling and entertaining, so let's welcome her to the show. Hey, Sensei Bachelor, how are you? I am excellent. Just LaRoyce is fine. Oh, well, did, oh, we, talk, did we talk about that when we talked before in the, in the, the reason that we, we kind of strong arm that that formality into this i don't know if we talk I about do it. the I, same I, thing i do, whenever yeah. i see a sensei it's it's a so how are you today sensei yep and and on a on a personal level you know i mm -hmm. i i appreciate that and if we were you know if we were in the same room i would i would accept that and i would i would call you by the Le, rice but on the show it's funny because one of the goals of the show is to appeal to as broad a group of people as possible Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody's going to get offended if we're using formal titles in the introduction, <laughs> but there are people that would, and it's so silly to me, but there are people that would, if we did, you know, <laughs> probably, yeah, probably it, it's <laughs> I, all the majority of the time when I meet someone, even in a martial arts environment, it's, you know, hi, I'm, I'm Jeremy. And, and, and I saw someone recently and I, and I did that and I introduced myself. And I watched the wheels turn in their head because they were so unused to the, the group of people we were in. Everyone introduces themselves by title. You know, it was like, I'm Grandmaster So-and-so. And that's, <laughs> and that's fine. But this person, like, I could, I watched the wheels turning and they didn't know what to do. So they introduced themselves as master and then last name. And I was like, cool. Nice to meet you. <laughs> it's a weird world we live in, isn't it? No, I understand. I, I have a lot of um, I have a lot of students who aren't quite sure how to address me. So I have a core that I have had in university classes, and I've also had in karate classes, oh, and I've right, also right. had in speech. And they call me Doctor Sensei Coach. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> I love it. I love it. 
<laughs> it takes it's, a little to say, but it's endearing. Yeah. Well, great. Well, how are you? I'm excellent. I'm sorry to hear you've had technical difficulties. I know. Oh, it was. <laughs> it, it was. It was kind of the worst. And um, li- listeners, you know, most of them will will likely know what happened because I did an episode, uh, just a very quick couple minutes to say, here's what happened because for the first time in three years, we didn't have an episode. Mm-hmm. And there were five lined up. Mm-hmm. And Skype updated something and it messed the whole thing up and it looked like it recorded and it recorded, you know, what did we talk for a little over an hour? It recorded an hour of silence. <laughs> Although that would have been an excellent meditative practice to broadcast. It could, sure, sure. I, I, I don't know that that's really our jam, but you know, we could, you know, we could do meditative episodes where we just drop them out in the middle, and you have to learn to accept that this is what's happened and breathe. Uh, but of course, we discovered that thirty six hours before I went on my first vacation in four and a half years. Right. Which kind of reinforced to me the need for a vacation because I start my, my first thought was well maybe I shouldn't go oh no right and then there were a couple of people that said you're insane you you need to go and um, everyone was you know we got some feedback people were very understanding and, and uh, no one yelled at me so it was fine <laughs> <laughs> yes I, I heard that uh, I heard I heard the episode and, and I thought you know that's actually a really interesting uh, perspective in and of itself that I, I know too many people who will not admit that something happened, something that they could not foresee has happened, or uh, and it has affected their productivity, or it has, and they won't admit it. They'll they'll uh, make all manner of obfuscation, but won't admit, hey, didn't see that coming. <laughs> and that was my gut reaction initially was to just kind of pretend nothing had happened, and then I realized, hey, wait a second, you're being dumb. Don't be dumb. <laughs> Bad things happen. It's okay. You're human. Mm-hmm. Embrace it. <laughs> but I thank, thank you. you for your willingness to come back and talk to me again. And, and you know, it, on a personal level, you know, I, I enjoyed our first conversation. But now, you know, who knows? Maybe this will go even better because we've talked before. Indeed. You don't know. You don't know. And, you know, quite often... We'll just kind of, we'll we'll have kind of some some pre chat and then launch into the show, but it almost feels like we're in a good place. So I I kind of want to just move forward from here and and not edit any of this. If you're okay with it, I'm perfectly okay cool. with that. All right. Well, you mentioned, and and this might be a good way to give the listeners some context. You mentioned that some of your students call you Doctor Sensei Coach. Yeah. You said yes. It was? yes. Do you want to unpack each of those for us and? And let us know what's going on in these three parts of your life. I don't know how it happens. I love my students. I love all of my students. And I become very interested in their success. And as a as probably more of a reciprocal kind of relationship, they want to be more engaged in the things that I do. So I have had people who were students in my classes at the university level and find out that I also teach Shotokan Karate. So then they want to take those classes as well. And very often um, I refer to my experiences in karate as one of the sources of strength and and tenacity in pursuing uh, a doctoral degree. So then they become very interested in that linkage. The other part is that I also coach speech and debate. And but I never get to a place of impassioned debate. It's always very critical. It's always very calm and and very analytical. And I can argue pretty much any side. And looking at that, uh, the students also become very interested in, well, how do you do that? How do you not become impassioned? How do you see someone else's perspective so easily? And I say, well, it's because of speech and debate. So then they become involved in uh, forensics or speech and debate. And there's a a crew probably of about uh, five or six in my 30 years of teaching who have come on board with all of the things that I do. And those individuals have, have taken to calling me Dr. Sensei coach. I love it. I love it. That's fantastic. I did a little bit of speech and debate in high school and, and had a great time with it. And, uh, you know, one of the things I remember going in to tell the debate coach, my mother's not really fond of this because 
now some of these silly things that she wants me to do just because um, I'm able to articulate why I shouldn't do them. And she's not happy about that. And he said in his, you know, 20, 30 years of coaching debate, that was the number one reason students left. Their parents didn't like that it made the students better at arguing. Indeed, yes. Or better better at articulating yeah. the fallacies of the argument being presented. Exactly. Now, where's the connection between the three? Is there a connection between the three? If, if, you're, if you're that interested, I mean, I can see a connection between any of the two, but do you draw a thread through all three of those? Absolutely. I think the thread of all three is mindfulness and compassion or empathy. So I have to, in my teaching, I have to be mindful of the students who are in front of me. I, I, it's actually on my email and it's on my resume, teach the student, not the course. And I think far too many people are very proud of their PowerPoints and they parade out their expertise, but forget about the people in front of them. That is also the key to effective argumentation and debate is to be able to put yourself in the other person's position to understand the information to which they have access, the position and values that they place on a particular issue. And then that's also the case in, in karate. We move as our opponent moves as the Niju Kun would say. So you have to be mindful and present and compassionate toward your opponent at any given time, and that aids your practice. So of these three, academia, speech and debate, martial arts, which one came first for you? Well, I've been, uh, I would say speech and debate. I've been doing speech and debate since junior high. Uh, my, uh, we did grammar and argumentation and analysis of of current events around the dinner table for fun my and sport. My father was a, an English teacher, uh, 47 years, actually. He's, he's 85 and he still teaches. He's oh, still that's cool. <laughs> but it doesn't matter if you agree or disagree with him. As long as you can articulate and have appropriate supporting materials, um, he, he will entertain any position. And I think that's where speech and debate started, but also my love of, research and academia. And then I became an academic. Um, in 1992, I started teaching at the uh, University of North Dakota in 1992. But I was a latecomer to martial arts, um, only joining after my son, my oldest son, became very frustrated with team sports and a student, <laughs> uh, again, someone who called me Dr. Sensei coach, uh, but Sensei came later for him. Uh, he gave us free, uh, a free membership for my son. And um, as I was sitting there and my son was taking classes anyway, I thought, I can do this. I can do this. So we started training together. And I have to admit, it elevated both of our training. Hmm. Did you ever, I mean, were you, were you training in the same classes as your son? Initially, no. Initially, um, I would train with him in the kids' classes, or he would train in the kids' classes, and I would train in the all levels. But very quickly, uh, our sensei, uh, Ron Porath, saw that my son approached it not as a child in an athletic activity or a recess activity, but he saw it very much as a martial art. And he invited uh, my son at the time to join the all levels class. So then from that point on, we trained together in all classes. What was that like training with family members? I mean, some, and I guess, let me tell you why I'm asking that question. I did not have the best of experiences working out side by side with my mother. Mm -hmm. And I've known plenty of other families where it didn't always go well, that the ability to separate roles could be challenging. But yet I know other families that, they say it's it's been one of the best things for them. It's brought them closer together. And some schools even design some of the format of their classes around bringing in families. What was your experience? Well, we learned very quickly that we would train harder with each other than we would with other people because we knew where the, the other person's, I knew where my son's uh, physical edge was and he knew where my physical edge was. So we were able to push each other in a way 
that we wouldn't push other people. So it came, it came from a place of, I think, a deep mutual respect. And we still have that today. Uh, he will still push me and I will still push him. And we do train together. Um, it aided him tremendously. He became a United States Marine and that training aided him tremendously. He was able to not only learn MICMAP, the Marine Corps Martial Arts Program, very, very quickly and very well, but he was also able to achieve um, a mental state where the constant derision from drill instructors did did not... Uh, debilitate him mentally or emotionally. He was able to keep a, a, a equanimity to him during that. So even even today, we're still very much uh, partners in training. And what was it like after class, you know, the drive home or around the dinner table on another evening? Were you talking about martial arts or avoiding that and keeping it within the dojo? Were there rules, I guess? Um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say there were rules. We were mindful that other people did not train. So when we were with people who did not train, uh, that was not something that we decided to speak about ex- exclusively because it would exclude others from the conversation. But on the ride home or the ride to or when it was just the two of us or in uh, other group situations, we very often would talk about, okay, what, what did you get out of that class? Here's what I got out of that class. Here's my questions. Can we work on this together? Um, when do you think, you know, where do you see this in this kata? Where do you see this? You know, so we did bounce, uh, concepts and, and ideas and evaluations off each other quite frequently. Do you think that brought you closer together sharing that with your son? Absolutely. And I think with my debate background, we were able to look at training in a very different way. What if this is useful? If a sensei says do it because we've always done it that way, that was insufficient. And we would talk about that and we would talk about, all right, so what is an appropriate answer? And that actually guided our choices with whom we trained. And I think for him, that also guided him in many of his choices. As we talk about these kind of three elements of your life that are connected and and overlap, I'm kind of envisioning this this Venn diagram. (laughs) How has your martial arts helped you in your non-martial arts instruction? I mean, we'll, we'll lump speech debate and and academic under that heading of instruction. And how has your non-martial arts influenced your martial arts? Well, I think I'll start with the non-martial arts first and how it has influenced my martial arts. My academic background and, and my passion for research has fueled uh, a voracious appetite for all things martial arts. I have a, a huge library and I'm always, when, when a sensei says, are there any questions? I always have questions and I always have, um, I've been told I have very difficult questions because I've spent a lot of time thinking. I've spent a lot of time practicing. I've spent a lot of time sort of analyzing it. So from an academic perspective, as a student, I bring that mindset into uh, the class when I train, when I teach, I take that same approach as a professor where I break down what it is that I want the students to learn. And I break it down into its smallest components so that I can bring them along step by step. And I can see at what point by watching the students in, in my karate classes, I can see at what point they finally put it all together. And what's that critical mass of, oh, I get it now. I get it. I have to. So I would say I use my academic training um, quite, it's quite invasive into my martial arts. The other way around uh, my martial arts training into my academic life, there was a huge shift that occurred in me right after I acquired my first Dan. And in that same year, I call it my fear factor year, because in that year, I ran a marathon. <laughs> I, I repelled 19 stories. Oh, uh, cool. I ate live crickets for charity. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I started a PhD program. So I call it my fear factor year. Uh, but it was acquiring my Dan and knowing, hey, I can do this, uh, that sort of fueled a lot of other huge leaps and advancements in my academic and, and personal life and in my career uh, in pursuing a PhD in rigorous research. Um, the idea that, you know, this, this idea we chatted last time, this idea of one more, when a lot of my classmates in my doctoral program were saying, no, I'm done, I'm done. I always had it in me. Well, I can do one more. I can do one more. So I can do one more article. I can do one more class. I can do one more year. And that's how I made it through my doctoral program. I have to say, of the four things that you rattled off, repelling 19 stories, running a marathon, starting your PhD and eating crickets, <laughs> the eating crickets one, I'm thinking, oh, easy, over and done with. That, that's the one that I think I would, I would do over and over again before any of the others. <laughs> <laughs> In truth. How often do you refer back to that first on test, to that transition? It's something I hear a lot of people talk about with regard to martial arts, that, that step, that reflection. And it, it sounds like it's something that you bring into your day to day. I, I do bring it to pretty much every time that I teach, every time that I'm in a project. Um, the reason I do that is a lot of, I see it in a lot of instructors that they create a lot of mysticism and a lot of fear around that Dan exam. Um, my instructor did just the opposite. He demystified it all. He said, I'm going to tell you all of the answers to the test. And what's more is I'm going to show you all the answers to the test. The problem is me showing it, you, you the answers does nothing. <laughs> you still have to go out and be able to do it. You still have to be able to incorporate everything that I'm telling you into a test that is going to be an hour and 15 minutes long of extreme rigorous emotional and physical um, activity. So you still have to be able to do that. So I think I look at that and that particular day, I can remember pretty much everything of that test. And in any given moment of that test, there is something that is more generalizable that I can use on a daily basis. So when I had to fight, I had to fight um, a man who dramatically outranked me and was a national sparring champion. So that whole idea of stepping into the ring against someone who is younger, stronger, faster, outranks you, uh, it could have easily been daunted and discouraged but I walked into that and said okay this is it is what it is this this is my opponent move as my opponent moves and watch for my opportunities so that's daily life that's that's driving in traffic yeah. <laughs> so the the demands of the test also of being able to remain mentally calm when you're sort of doing this laundry list of things that you know that you've done wrong, this, oh, I did that wrong in that, in, in that sequence. Oh, I did that wrong in, in kata that, that was, I can do better. So keeping this sort of laundry list of what went wrong, I suddenly realized uh, in that test was unhelpful. So I refer to that almost on a daily basis. And the mistakes are in the past and they are unhelpful. So I would say I use... All of the elements, not only of that Dan exam, but all the, the subsequent Dan exams, um, I use them daily. My last, <laughs> my last Dan exam, uh, my sensei, Yutaka Yaguchi, he's 84. He survived Hiroshima. He was one of the original six sent out from JKA in Japan by Funakoshi to spread Shurokan Karate to, to the Western world. He, uh, he was conducting my test. And afterward he came up to me and he extended his hand and he congratulated me. And then he pulled me close with, with the hand that he was shaking and put up his other finger and said, uh, remember you are not bull <laughs> because I, I don't retreat. I'll, I'll, I'll take the punch. I'll take the kick and, and I will advance, but that's not, 
uh, he's trying to remind me that I have more in me than just a determination to go forward. There's a strategy that is the next level of my training. Have you always been that way, that, that bull moving forward? Has this been a difficult transition to wrap your brain around doing it differently? Yes, I have always been, you know, full speed ahead, damn the torpedoes. I, I, I conquer anything that way that with, in my belief, with sufficient force, determination and, and uh, perseverance, any brick wall becomes rubble. <laughs> that, that's not necessarily the uh, the best approach. Uh, you know, a better approach might be uh, teamwork, and we scale over that wall. The best approach might be uh, take a step back and and see what other tools might uh, might be availed. There might be a door somewhere else on that wall that that I'm just not seeing. So yes, I, I that was um, that's a, a little piece of enlightenment that I am still chewing on. As you look back over your your time in your training, what's the what's the story that you would tell us? Your favorite story from your time? Oh, so many. There always uh, are. <laughs> that the martial arts leaves us with no shortage of stories, and that's why I love asking this question because it so often people have to, you know, chew through and. and when we've had people on multiple times, the stories are, are completely different stories or I'll meet someone and they'll tell me a follow up. And, you know, here's the real version that I couldn't quite tell you on the air because of, you know, these details that weren't appropriate. It's just, it, it's amazing. The stories that come out of martial arts. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think uh, you and I had discussed this before, but there's this, um, uh, per perceived division between sports or tournament karate and and what some people would call traditional uh, karate. Um, that division, I think, I saw it uh, during one Dan exam uh, a few years ago. There was a national, actually world champion in Shotokan karate, and he was testing for, I forget what Dan, maybe fourth Dan or fifth Dan, I don't recall. Uh, young, uh, very athletic, and he had the classic uh, bounce and evade sort of uh, an approach to sport karate sparring. And Yuguchi uh, Sensei, very wise man. Um, so we're in this tiny room in uh, in South Dakota, and there had to be probably 50, 60 people sitting around on the floor in Cezar watching this Dan exam. And I was there with one of my, uh, with one of my, my students who was getting ready to test for his knee down. So of course he was very interested in watching the Dan exams. And as, uh, the Kumite portion of the exam comes up, Sensei Yuguchi calls out another sport competitor to spar against this Dan candidate. And, you know, they, they bounce and, you know, they go in and they have their reverse punch tags and, you know, um, evade quite effectively. And, and they spar for quite a while, both of them sweating profusely. And Yuguchi Sensei ends the sparring. And this this sport competitor, he steps back. And, and Yuguchi Sensei calls up another one another individual that does a lot of tournament and, and again, they start sparring and, and there's a lot of this, you know, sort of jab reverse punch and, and the, the bouncing and the, uh, um, the staying just out of range and, and a lot of time evading each other. Uh, and, and again, you know, it goes on for quite a while. Now they're both red faced and, and breathing quite heavily. And, and this is, I'm watching this and I'm like, this is very interesting. We have to fight multiple opponents when we get our dance. And I'm wondering where this person's athletic edge is. And, and I'm watching it for other things such as, um, as an instructor, what is it that the, uh, that Yuguchi is seeing? What is it that the other instructors are seeing? And I'm, you know, sort of watching all of that different levels. And Yuguchi separates them and he brings out a third, um, individual, not quite so sport karate, but still, you know, um, very much that sort of jab reverse punch or, you know, front snap kick kind of an approach to, um, martial arts in and out and a couple of tags and, uh, Yuguchi separates them and, you know, 
Um, <laughs> so far, the the person testing for Dan, every opponent they've had has been similar in age and similar in rank and similar in training and similar in fighting style. And uh, the next moment, um, Sensei calls up a, a very senior ranking sensei in our region, John Harder, who's fantastic, by the way. He's absolutely a fantastic individual, amazing sensei. Uh, but he's very, very old school. So he <laughs> walks up uh, into the ring and he bows and, and Yuguchi sensei says, John, John, glasses. Oh, yeah, he'd forgotten to take off his glasses. So he takes off his glasses and he sets them down and he walks up to the edge of the ring and uh, stands there in yoi, ready position. And they say, you know, uh, come on, say, uh, begin. And the other, the, the Dan candidate starts, you know, bouncing around and, and, uh, uh, getting distance and then backing up. And John is just standing there very still in his yoy position blocks when he needs to, but he hasn't moved his feet hardly at all. He's just very, very still. And we're, everyone in the room is just sort of like, what, 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 what's going on? And John takes two very small steps forward, very slow, very deliberate, waits, waits. And the next thing you that we know, there's this loud thwap. And this Dan candidate is laying on the floor uh, looking up counting ceiling tiles. And everyone in the room is, oh, there's this audible gasp. And, and you know, and, and Yuguchi Sensei says, continue, continue. So the Dan candidate gets up and sort of shakes it off and he's like, Oh, okay. He starts back at it, bouncing around and, you know, tries a jab, reverse punch. And John just fairly easily and, and you know, adaptly evades it. No big deal. It doesn't actually move very much. And he waits. And again, he takes one slow step forward and another slow step forward. And then thwack <laughs> this Dan candidate. He swept this Dan candidate. He's looking up the ceiling tiles again. Well, now this Dan candidate is a little confused. Yuguchi sensei is just smiling ear to ear. And he says, continue, continue. So the Dan candidate gets up again. And he's like, I, I, he, he clearly does not know how to spar with this, this karate approach. He, he just can't figure out how to engage. So he goes back again to this sort of bounce, 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 jab, reverse punch. Well, John, again, one slow step forward, another slow step forward, sweeps him again, thwack. And Yaguchi sensei now is sort of giggling a little bit. He says, he's enough, he's enough. And he separates the two of them. And he is speaking to the Dan candidate. And he says, your sport karate training uh, is effective indeed, but is incomplete. So he was trying to make the point that while sport karate training does wonders for you athletically, there is a level of understanding that that individual should have at that Dan level that he has not acquired. And that perhaps learning from someone like John Harder is is a uh, the next step in his training and afterward everybody was just talking about oh my gosh did you see that test and you you were talking about how calm john was and how he just swept him you know he he didn't even punch him he just took him to the floor e pong full point right so that became a source of conversation for the next few months about how sport karate and self defense or self preservation karate are not necessarily um, uh, polar opposites. They require each other, but the pursuit of one to the exclusion of the other is a disservice to the martial art. And how have you taken that into your teaching? I approach it probably as, as Funakoshi and Nakayama approached it. Uh, I do I do tournaments. I participate in tournaments. I, um, um, I spar, I do kata. So we have, uh, nationals in Canada coming up in May. It'll be in Quebec city. And then we have nationals in the United States in Sioux Falls in November. Um, I will attend both tournaments. I will compete in one, um, everything, um, I can do at those tournaments I do, and I do it expressly with 
the idea that I would never ask my students to do something that I am not willing to do myself. And I think there comes a point for a lot of people when they start to avoid competition, whether they think they're going to get beat or um, they think, you know, they're above that or their, their talents are best used in another way. Um, I think bringing all that you are to a tournament is also part of your training. Now, um, I have been accused of not uh, doing sport karate. <laughs> so when I spar, I am very seated. I am very still. I am very patient. Um, but that has afforded me tremendous success to date. So it's, it's something I do. I do tournaments and I do what other people would consider to be sport karate, but I reconcile it with a more traditional and mindful approach of service. And as long as we're playing by the same rules, it gives you the (laughs) flexibility to do what works for you. If if everyone is sparring the exact same way, it's sorry to say it's probably going to be pretty boring (laughs) and it's going to be really hard to find What's best for you to, to find your own niche, I guess, within, within that space. And I think that's an important part of development, don't, don't you, to find where you fit? No, I, I agree. And everyone has a different body type and everyone has a different, your brain is wired differently. So you see different things when, when you're in a martial arts. And I think if we only teach it one way, we, um, we do disservice to the other students who come to us for a variety of reasons. So, and, and I do train broadly. I've trained with a great many, absolutely fantastic senseis from so many different organizations. Uh, and, and there are some times that I've disagreed with what they taught, but in that moment, when you're in the class, you suspend your own judgment and you say, I'm just going to absorb what they're teaching. And then later in your own training, you, you play with those concepts and you see what works for you and what doesn't. And then that becomes part of your martial art. It becomes part of your approach to how you train. But I think to, to say, oh, I, I'm not, I, that, that's, that's not the correct way. That's not the way it should be done. Well, why? Well, just because it's not. Well, <laughs> that's... Um, that's doing many, many practitioners a disservice. I've never been a big fan of the right way. There can be a better way, but I think it depends on what's important to you. The way I train for competition versus personal development versus strength versus honoring the tradition of a particular instructor. Those are all different. And I'm okay with those being different. When you look over the people who you've trained with and under and perhaps even the folks that you've taught, who would you say has been the most influential on your martial arts? Oh, tough question. Um, in terms of people I've taught, start there. <laughs> um, the, the first individual that I trained to, to black belt that I trained to Dan, his name is Phil Reagan. Uh, he was and is an amazing martial artist and, and he aided me when I was testing for my dance, even though I outranked him. Um, and he needed to learn to not go, um, easy on me because I was substantially older than him or easy on me because I was his sensei. So he learned to go as hard against me or harder against me than he would against other individuals. And I think, that reminded me that I am no different than anyone else with whom he trains. And, and that, I think, was an absolutely fantastic uh, lesson for both of us. And he and I still talk about the path. Um, training with, I would have to say, my son. He and I still have conversations about basic, basic techniques and approaches. We have conversations about, um, the application of, of, of different, um, techniques was, uh, um, whom I've trained under. 
the most most influential, of course, would be my sensei uh, Yutaka Yuguchi, an amazing individual, absolutely phenomenal. He, in all the time I've trained with him, has never steered me wrong. He has often said things that were difficult, um, but said in such a way that you understood that he truly cared, um, not just about how you were doing as a student, but how you were as, as a human. And he, to this day, he's, he's my, he's my touchstone. Um, I often will uh, seek out his, his influence and his advice. Um, another individual would be Phil Harris, Sensei Phil Harris. Now he's a different organization, WTKO, but he was one of my senseis. And to me, he's the epitome of what a sensei should be. He is uh, calm in his approach, but he incites a certain level of desire to accomplish, desire to master in his students that I have seen uh, other senseis attempt, but they try to do it through fear or intimidation. And and you truly want to learn what uh, Sensei Phil is trying to relate. So he brings to his students a certain crispness, a speed and a snap and an accuracy that I have not experienced in training with other individuals. Um, I've, I've trained broadly. So my sensei uh, from the dojo who trained me directly, Ron Porath, he was always very encouraging. And his response was, there are so many different ways to run a dojo. Uh, don't think that there is a single recipe. Find what works for you and your students and your location. And then that's your recipe. You know, don't think that your dojo has to look like so-and-so's dojo or so-and-so. Um, it, it needs to look like, like those people. It needs to reflect those people. So I still use that today. Um, as my, my dojo grows and changes, I remember that it's their dojo. How is, how has that recipe changed in your dojo? What's when, different now versus, you know, early days? Well, when we first started out, it was a very, very small group of six or seven individuals, and it was more communal training. <laughs> we, we trained together, and I would take them through uh, and prepare them for, for their test. And, but now we're a decade later and we've had, I can't, I can't tell you how many students and, and, um, many, 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 you know, national medals and all of that. So now I rely very heavily on my senior ranks and my senior ranks are amazing individuals. They bring all that they are to class and now it's a it's an it's a, an inclusive community. It is a community where we hold each other to a higher standard. Our primary administrator is Karen Katranak, who is preparing for her first Dan exam. She keeps everyone right on task. Mm. <laughs> she keeps everyone uh, to a schedule and right on time, and and she keeps everyone mindful of where they are and what needs to be done. Uh, Dusty Larson, who's also a first Q, uh, he keeps everyone mindful of the spirit of karate, this idea of one more. And oh, that one wasn't perfect, so we're going to have to do it again. And it's okay that we have to do it again. That's the whole point. So he keeps everyone very mindful of the spirit of karate. And then Mohammed Mahmoud is also a first Q, and he keeps, he's our cheerleader. He keeps everyone excited to come back to class again and again and again. And he's the one that has gotten us in front of uh, media. And um, he is, he's our champion in terms of, of PR and marketing. I used to do all of that myself. And I have to admit, it is a much, much better recipe when you have senior rank that can bring who they are to those roles. And all it, 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 it creates an environment of inclusion that is very difficult to do if you're doing it all by yourself. Pretty much everything is easier when you have the right people around you, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> the wrong people, of course. It's a lot easier to do stuff on your own, but when everyone's 
on track, when they're unified, when the goal seems clear. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like you have a wonderful team there with you. That's fantastic. Now, if you if we could bring someone into that dojo with you, someone to train just for a little while, someone from anywhere in time that you haven't trained with, who would you train with? It's a really hard question because I... If, if if someone is living and I want to train with them, I go train with them. So Ian Abernethy or Gary, Gary Swain or James Fields, it, I find a way and I, I go train with them. <laughs> so I think um, the one that remains would be Nakayama. And Nakayama from um, – he he died before it became International Shotokan Karate Federation. It was still JKA at the time, Japanese Karate Association, uh, Funakoshi's first and and um, most prolific student, because he saw that the kata is the encyclopedia, and all the answers are there, but all it is is a reference. You still have to pull out all of the components. You still have to practice all of the components and put them into keyhorn. You still have to practice those opponents or those uh, components with an opponent. And that becomes Kumite. I, I recently was, uh, you'll forgive me, listening to another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite okay. <laughs> and uh, this individual was talking about the three Ks, Kata, Kihon, and Kumite, and how all of these are separate in most martial arts, and, and none of them contribute to each other. And I, I found myself it, it vehemently disagreeing because they are intimately linked. And it's, isn't it a shame that that individual had not experienced the, the marriage of those three things in his own training? What a tragedy. So I... I would say Nakayama because he saw the interconnectedness of everything that is involved in martial arts. And I think because of time, because we no longer train uh, eight hours a day, every day, people no longer, very few people anyway, don't, they don't make this their path. Um, it, it, they, you do have to sort of choose. You have to choose, you know, what is going to be the rabbit hole that you climb down, if it's going to be kumite or if it's going to be kata or if it's going. And I think that the interconnectedness of all of them and including the spirit of, of, of Shotokan Karate, all of those incorporated into a single lifelong path. I think that is probably the most important thing I still have to learn from him. Valuable lesson. <laughs> Now, we talked about competition. We talked about it as something that you still do, something that I don't know if you necessarily expect your students to do compete, but I think I heard you say that. <laughs> so I want to talk about the why. Because competition is something that is, is a bit polarizing on this show. And I'm, I'm, I've got a feeling I know where you're going to go. I'm not going to tell you where I think you're going to go, but <laughs> talk to us about where competition fits in for you as both a martial artist and a martial arts instructor? Well, the first thing that I tell my students when they come to a tournament, and this is before they've competed, I tell them you already beat everyone else who decided the couch was more comfortable than coming to a tournament. And I think that's part, a part that we forget, that that motivation to sign up, that motivation to get up, that motivation to train, means that you have already separated yourself from a field of individuals who decided that they'd rather binge watch uh, friends or whatever. So that's the first distinction. And the second is that by stepping into that ring, whether it's for kata or kumite or whatever it is, there's a certain level of adrenaline that must be mastered in order to keep a calm head, in order to bring yourself fully into that ring at that moment that closely mimics what would be required in a true altercation or what would be required for the next huge leap of personal growth or what would be required um, for any stretch of, of human development. And then whatever the judges decide knowing that that judgment is beyond your control and being able to accept it with equanimity, whether you win 
or you lose, realizing the impermanence of that moment, realizing that that judge's decision is out of your control, is temporary, and you will recover. (laughs) So those are the, the lessons that I tell my students. These are the most valuable things about going to a tournament. Don't, in, in the Niju Kun, the 20 precepts of life talks about, you do not have to, you do not have to win. Just don't lose. And I think that that's an important distinction that a lot of people don't understand You know, they sort of slap on this platitude of sometimes I win, sometimes I learn. Okay, that's that is one way of looking at that particular um, precept. But the other part is that I don't have to win. I just have to not lose. So what does losing look like? And I think it's the clinging to this idea of win or lose um, this Uh, that creates much of the angst around tournament. As a competitor, it's, again, stepping into that ring, knowing that all of my students are watching, (laughs) knowing that my, uh, the people, the people from my region, the other senseis in my region are watching and saying, no, this is about my practice. This is about my art. It's not about who's watching. It's not about impressing anyone. It's about pushing myself to bring the best that I have of my art this moment. I think you said it all right there. <laughs> I don't, I don't even have a follow up. I don't I got nothing. <laughs> Martial arts movies. You watch them? Are you a fan? Yeah. We're changing gears completely here. Well, I, Oh boy. First of all, I think it should be noted. I I don't enjoy, uh, television. I don't enjoy, um, time spent stationary mesmerized before a flickering image. Um, so I, I've never understood being captivated by, uh, that sort of two dimensional experience. So I, no, I don't watch, I don't watch TV. I don't watch movies. Um, that being said, every now and again, my children do sort of say, mom, you need to sit down and, and we're going to watch this movie together. So that does happen. I have seen all the karate kid movies, uh, and my visceral response is, oh my gosh, that's awful. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, there is, uh, you can acquire, uh, an appreciation of the choreography, particularly there's a sequence in Ip Man that was done in one take where he's fighting on a spiral staircase. You can admire the, um, the ability and the choreography of that moment, but I don't, you know, I I don't have a favorite movie. I, I, yes, I've watched all of the, the Bruce Lee movies, but you know, those are because somebody said you should. And I'm like, okay, yeah, okay. I'll watch them. Do they contribute to my training? No. Do I admire any of them profoundly as martial artists and people with whom I would like to train? No, it is purely entertainment. And because I don't find value in that particular kind of entertainment, um, (laughs) I'm afraid I don't have a favorite. That's okay. And right there, we, we learn a lot about you in, in that question. You know, you're clearly, you are a, you are a doer. And I'm going to guess that there are probably those around you that that have said from time to time, "Would you just slow down?" Is that is that a fair assessment? <laughs> All the time. All right. Okay. Well, got you pigeonholed a little bit then, and and I get that, and and you know I have times in my life when when that is me as well. Absolutely. When when you know I, I roll out of bed and it's coffee in hand, and I go 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 go, and realize okay, it's ten o'clock at night. I haven't watched TV. I haven't stopped. I've barely eaten because there were things that were more important and that's okay. But then, you know, I'll freely admit there are days I spend on the couch to balance it out. <laughs> <laughs> How about books then? You know, you, you said that you were constantly asking questions, so I'm going to suspect books hold a different place. Absolutely. I, as I said, I have a, a huge martial arts library. I, I troll used bookstores for out of print 
martial arts books. And I, um, I have several used book dealers who keep an eye out on things for me, and Amazon and audiobooks. My, uh, I, I do have a few favorites. The first one being, and I think all martial arts artists should read it because all martial arts are cousins. There's not one that's better or more important than another. All martial artists walk the same path and we're all cousins. And, and that is illuminated by the book called the Bubishi. I prefer the McCarthy translation, but there are others out there and the Bubishi demonstrates, but nobody's really sure how old it is. Um, but it demonstrates 72 habitual acts of violence. And, and if you look at the 72 habitual acts of violence, it, it spans all martial arts. Anybody can look at that and say, Oh yeah, that's Yamazuki mountain punch or, Oh yeah. You know, so they can look at it and see their own martial art. So I would say the Bubishi is a, a constant source of, of information and inspiration for me. The second, of course, uh, Gishin Funakoshi's Karate Do, My Way of Life. I probably read that at least once a year, along with Yutaka Yuguchi's Mind, Body, Like Bullet. Um, his, his book, Mind, Body, Like Bullet, I, there are segments in it that are written by other senseis. And what I've done is every time I travel, I will take that book with me. And when I train with any one of those senseis, I ask them to please sign their section of the book. And then I reread that section and make sure that I know who it is with whom I'm training. And I mention certain parts. So I was training with uh, Sensei Jim Fields, who's out in Santa Monica. And I mentioned to him, I asked him a, a similar question to you asked me. I said, how is your life in karate similar to your career in the NFL? Because he was a, he was a, a nationally renowned football player. And he said... <laughs> You're, you shamelessly flatter me, <laughs> but he signed the book. Uh, and then we had a long conversation about the difference between athleticism and martial arts. So it was fantastic. Um, probably the, one of the last favorites one, and I make a point of reading these books every year is Teriyuki Okazaki wrote perfection of character. And Perfection of Character is a book looking at the dojo-kun. Um, most martial arts have some sort of oath or recitation that they say at the end of class. Ours uh, in Shotokan Karate is seek perfection of character, be faithful, endeavor to excel, respect others, and refrain from impulsive behavior. And in his book, Perfection of Character, he has a look at each of those and outlines how they apply to daily life, not just martial arts, but in everything that you do. So each of those books are, I read at least once a year, if not more often. I've read some of them and some of some of them. They're great books. I, I, for the same reason you have trouble with movies, I have trouble with TV because I, I want to go. TV will shut my brain down. Mm -hmm. Books. I've started doing a lot with, with audiobooks, and unfortunately, a lot of the, the great martial arts books are not out there as audiobooks, although I just got a Facebook message from my brother recently that he found Zen in the Martial Arts on Audible. So he's, oh. he's digging into that. Yeah. Let's talk about the future. You are very clearly passionate about martial arts, passionate about, about training and teaching. And it doesn't sound like that's changing. It sounds like, if anything, that passion has grown. My question is why? What is it about your training and what you see as you look out into the future for you as a martial artist that has you excited? I think it has to do with when you get your black belt, it's the beginning it's not the end goal. It's the beginning. It's like getting your high school diploma. Now you get to go out and, and truly explore what it is that you, that you love. And it doesn't matter how much I train or with whom I train or how many questions I ask. There's always more. So when I got my doctorate, it was okay. You're now doctor off you go. <laughs> and while the research continues, 
there's nothing after that. There's not another doctorate unless I completely do a different discipline, unless I uh, do a whole other uh, academic pursuit. But in martial arts, there's always, always another Dan. There's always another um, specific style or, or something about a kata that can be unlocked. There's always someone that illuminates something in your training. So it is a constant source of fascination every time. So I do my katas. I do every kata I know twice a day, every day. And just today I was doing a kata called Wang Kan, which is King's Hat. And I'm doing this kata and I suddenly realized, oh my goodness, there's something so incredibly interesting in this turn. So I did that turn about 30, 40 times and then did the kata again as a whole. And it changed the way not only I do that kata, but all of a sudden I wanted to do all of the katas again and see if that same tweak, that same understanding of that turn applied to other katas as well. (laughs) So it's just, it's because it's never ending and because it's continually interesting and because it's such a source of peace, people have said it's the fast path to Zen. And I think every martial artist has experienced that when you're in class and the monkey mind stops because all you can think about is the next count. All you can think about is one more. All you can think about is that moment. And with that comes a tremendous source of peace. So I think that is why I will always train. And if people want to get a hold of you, whether that be social media or maybe email or they're coming through North Dakota or, or something, you know, how would people, you know, get in touch with you? UND Hisho Karate, that's H-I-S-S-H-O-U, Hisho, is available on Facebook, uh, also Instagram, and also on Twitter. The easiest thing is put in UND Karate, University of North Dakota Karate, and we pop up all over the place. We pop up in news media, we pop up on on social media, so that's probably the easiest way. Um, For myself... um, Again, that's probably also the easiest way if people wanted to get a hold of me personally. Uh, I have a very strange name, Leroy Bachelor. Uh, I have yet to meet another one with that name. So uh, a very quick search, and, and it's easy to find me on all social medias as well as with my, my institution. We'll show you my professional profile as, a, as an academic. Great. Great. And, of course, folks, if you're new to the show or maybe you've forgotten – Whistlekick martial arts radio.com. We'll have the show notes there for everything on this episode. Links to Sensei's social media website, you know, that whole the whole thing will be there. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely wonderful to get to talk to you again. And I, I I'm I'm lucky. I'm lucky that you were willing to come back and, and just share in, in equally wonderful and, and yet still different episode. And listeners, I'm lucky because you know, you don't get to hear that other one, and I'm sorry for that. <laughs> but we'll send it out in the traditional way. What parting words do you have for the folks listening? Well, first of all, thank you, Jeremy. I think that Whistlekick is a fantastic podcast, and it's one of the few podcasts that truly tries to unite all martial artists because we do all walk the same path. And a lot of other podcasts try to separate and try to pull apart. And I think Whistlekick truly does try to unify it. And I want to tell you how much I appreciate that. And if I had to give some parting words, it's that there will be times in your training when you think, I I got nothing else. This is it. This is my last one. But everybody has one more. Sensei Bachelor is articulate and thoughtful, which had me listening to her more than really asking questions. I admire her dedication to teaching both the academic world and the martial arts world. She gives a lot of attention to her students in and out of the classroom. And it's an approach that I find to be common among the absolute best teachers of any discipline, really martial arts, otherwise. So Sensei Bachelor, thank you for being on the show today. Had a great time. If you want to check out the show notes, you probably know where those are. Whistlekick, martialartsradio.com. We've got links 
We've got photos. We've got 275 other episodes. So much going on over there. If you haven't been lately, check it out. And I want to hear from you. You can get a hold of me, Jeremy, at whistlekick.com. Of course, you can give us a shout out on social media. We are at Whistlekick, anywhere you can think of. And we hope that you have signed up for the newsletter. If not, jump on over. Do that. I hope all is well for you in your world. And the martial arts is making your life even better. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 